Happy Father's Day, fathers. Uh, as we begin the message, every family needs a father. That's how God designed it. In families without a father, the entire family suffers. This role, this father role was designed by God to lead the family into a deeper, personal, more personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Fathers, let me give you the most successful thing you can do for your family is to lead your family into a deeper, more intimate relationship with the Lord God. Amen. That, is, that is your greatest achievement. That is your greatest goal that God has put out before us. Sadly, today's world has attacked not only the father, but the entire family with confusion as to what constitutes a family and the roles within the family. Satan is doing everything he can to destroy families and the fathership role of dad as the leader of the family to worship and serve the Lord our God. All the issues we face as a nation, all the issues we face as a nation are designed by Satan to destroy the family as God designed it, which is why it is of great importance that we stand for God's truth as we live our lives in this world, which is falling, falling, falling further away from God's plan. So in review of what we've gone through the past uh, three weeks, in the next PowerPoint screen, it says, in all of these issues of pro-life, pro-traditional marriage, pro-U.S. Constitution, pro-Israel, pro-nationalism, and the pro-vetting immigration system, the greatest lesson, lesson in all of these is that God's word speaks to all of mankind's issues. Amen. All of them. And we've seen uh, in the past weeks, uh, we've cited God's word in every one of these issues where God is behind uh, and for life, traditional marriage, the Constitution, and the reason being he's for the Constitution is because over 50% of, of the U.S. Constitution are direct and indirect quotes from the Bible. Uh, we talked about pro-nationalism. Did you know that God is against globalism? We know that that is a huge, uh, a, a huge uh, topic about being, becoming globalist. But God is not a globalist. And we cited the Tower of Babel as, as, as God going against globalism. At the Tower of Babel, just to refresh your memory, the, the, the whole world at that time was wanted to build a tower to heaven. And they wanted to, they had the same mind, they had the same language. And God said, now, we need, we, he came down, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit came down and looked at what man was doing and said, now there is no evil that can be kept from them unless we do something. So God confused the languages and spread the people all over the world so that they would not be a, a, have a collective evil mind. God is against globalism. In fact, in Acts, he, he set all the nations and their boundaries. God set them. Mankind didn't set them. We think we did, but God set the boundaries. God caused us to be born here because we would have the greatest chance to know him as Savior and Lord and God and King. God sent other people to other lands for the same thing. He set the boundaries in the hopes that these men and women would search for him and seek him and find him because he's not very far away from any of us. So we see that all these issues of mankind, God's word speaks to all of them. So in the next PowerPoint screen, so in, in whatever difficult situation you may be in, whether it is marriage relationships, children relationships, work relationships, parental relationships, politics, or any conceivable situation, be assured that God's word speaks to all of them. This is why it is so important for us to be a student of God's word our entire lives so that we will have God's perspective on all things, on all things. It's easy to go along with what the world says, but God's word has a, has a much different standard. 
So as we pursue the journey of God's good versus Satan's evil, there are two enormously important questions everyone needs to consider and answer in this lifetime and as soon as possible. These questions shape our future both in the here and now and the eternal everlasting future. Therefore, these questions and answers are far more important than who you marry, what education you pursue, what job or career you pursue, where you live, and how many children you should have. These two questions are of epic proportion. The first question in the next PowerPoint screen says, the first question is, do you believe in God? And then an underlying question that goes with that is, which is extremely important, probably the most important part of the first question is, who is that God? If you believe in God, who is that God? Belief in God is important and has, very, has a very general and widespread meaning, which is why the underlying question of who that God is, is of extreme importance because believing in the wrong God, now get this, believing in the wrong God can be worse than not believing in God at all. In taking the first part of the question, belief in the God or higher power who exists beyond ourselves, who is much bigger and more uh, enormous than ourselves, is very important because it will frame the entire context of our lives. So believing in God is important, but believing in the right God is of, is of extreme importance. Now, we have been through the series called The One True God. We sang the song, The One True God. And in that series, we came to a conclusion. The next PowerPoint screen reveals, we must seek the one true God with a willingness to know him as he is, not as who we want him to be. Lots of times before, before we were saved and knew, knew uh, God's word, we formulated God in our own minds as what we wanted him to be. However, the one true God has been revealed out of Israel and is called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If we look at the uh, next PowerPoint screen, in Exodus 3, 6, it says, Then he said, I am God of your father. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The one true God will keep his eternal covenant with Israel. It was God's plan to, to use Israel as a nation to spread the knowledge of him to all the other nations and to bless every other nation on the earth. Now many scriptures in the Old Testament reveal a coming Messiah who is part of the one true Godhead. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is that Messiah. He is the part of the one true God. Anyone who denies Jesus as the Son of God and denies that, that he is God in human flesh is not believing in the one true God. Amen. There's only one God. There's one Lord, there's one faith, and there's one baptism. And it's all in Christ. John 14, 1, in the next PowerPoint screen says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Jesus speaking, saying, Believe also in me. Jesus would not have told you to believe in him if he was not God. And you all know this, and I'm just using this to refresh your memory so that you can help others understand this. Jesus also said to the... Uh, to the, um, his disciples, I am the, the, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life and no one comes to the Father but through me. Glory. There's no one else. All the other religions, as though, and, though, and even though we must respect them and respect people, all other religions who do not have Jesus at the core of their faith is false. And they're destined to a blackness of darkness forever. So please, brothers and sisters, understand, it is our, 
our duty, our responsibility, our love of them to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. True genuine belief in the one true God will epically change your life. I know it epically changed mine. Entering faith in the one true God by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, turning your life over to him by the power of the Holy Spirit will cause the Holy Spirit to enter your being, which is being born again in the Spirit. And the life of Jesus Christ, the Father and the Son, I mean the Father and the Holy Spirit, will now dwell within you. This will bring enormous change in your thinking and subsequently your behavior. And, and most of you already know this. Again, I'm just refreshing your memory so that you can share this with others. Now, I used, to be, I used to go to church, but I used to be forced to go to church. Instead of being forced to come to church now, after being born again, I want to come to church. I want to study God's Word. I want to be in His presence. I want to pray. I want to do all those things that I didn't want to do before because He changed me from the inside out. When we're born again, uh, we have a new spirit, which is beyond any human spirit. In the next PowerPoint screen, screen in 2 Corinthians, it says that, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he is a new creature, reborn, renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things and the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings a new life. And that is the amplified version. Believing in any other God other than the one true God might help you to be moral and honest and give you prideful feelings of piety, but, based, but it's based on God's made in the image of man instead of man being made in the image of God. Now, there are many religions mankind has made with the help of Satan because Satan is the author of confusion. You wonder why there's so many religions? Satan is trying to confuse everyone that they're, uh, and to deviate them from the one true God. These gods do not exist except in the false imagination of the human mind. Allah does not exist. Confucius was, a, was, a, was just a man. Buddha was just a man. Uh, and all the other religious leaders are just men or they're, they're false images in, in mankind's mind. Now the next PowerPoint screen, uh, Satan's evil plan. This is one of Satan's greatest evils in he has helped man create gods and religion in man's image instead of man being created in the one true God's image. So, in setting the record straight, Elohim created man in his image. In Genesis 1.26, as we look at the PowerPoint screen, then God said, let us, again, this is the amplified version, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image, according to our likeness, not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness, and let him have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth, and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. God said we could have aquariums, saltwater aqu aquariums, because <laughs> we have dominion over, over the fish. Amen? Now, Elohim wanted, uh, wanted man to live in complete harmony with him, the one true God. However, Here's what happened. Mankind rebelled, and you know the story. Mankind rebelled against a holy, righteous God and chose to know good and evil. Hence, we're studying the series, series God's Good, Satan's Evil, which is why we are uh, Adam and Eve, and us as well, we believed, believed God was holding out on us. Adam and Eve believed, well, God said you could eat of the... Uh, of any tree in the garden except for that one. And what is human nature like? We want that one, right? How many of you have gone and you've seen a sign that says wet paint? 
and you go touch it to see if it's wet. <laughs> do not touch wet paint. And we go touch it to see if it's wet. <laughs> we do that because we, 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 have, we have rebellion in us. So in, in the process, we were kicked out of God's presence and forced to live in the evil we chose to rebel in. See, we chose to, to be in evil. And in John 3, 16, but God loved, God so loved the world. You all know this. I didn't put it up on the screen because you know this. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. For he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the, through the world that the world through him might be what? Saved. Saved. Amen. And the PowerPoint screen says, however, since God so loved the world of his, the world of his creation, God sent his son, Jesus, to pay the debt of that rebellion. So through confession of our sinfulness, we could be reinstated into the holy presence of a holy God by trusting in Jesus' payment of our debt for us. Is there a hallelujah in the house? I am so glad that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There is nothing greater than that that you can accomplish. So, the only way back to the one true God is through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one true Son of God, by placing all of our faith in what Jesus the Messiah did at the cross to pay for our rebellion. We, by faith, re replace our not believing God in the garden to believing in the one true God in his death, burial, and resurrection. So we've, God has undone what we, what we messed up in the garden by putting our faith and trust in the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So, if our faith is genuine and inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit will quicken our spirit, making it alive when it was dead because of a rebellious sin. And here it is. Ephesians 2.1, the next PowerPoint screen, I think, says, And you he made alive when you were spiritually dead and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins, in which you once walked. You were following the ways of the world influenced by the present age in accordance with the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Satan. The spirit who is now in, at work in the disobedient, the unbelieving who fight against the purposes of God. When we, became, when we become a new creation in, in Christ Jesus and our relationship is restored, with the one true God, what a blessing that is. In the next PowerPoint screen it says, this, this faith and new birth of our spirit will change our here and now and our eternal destination. What a wonderful, amazing God we have to love us unfailingly and to seek to redeem us back into his presence. Faith in any other God other than the one true God, opens the doors to the pits of hell. God have mercy on us. So, so that's just a little uh, reminder of, of the one true God. Let's get into the second part, the second epic question. The next PowerPoint screen reveals, after belief in the one true God, the second question which affects our entire life here on earth and into eternity is this. Are people born good? Now, how many would, would agree that all that people are born good? Raise your hand. One, two, a few. Okay. As simple as this question sounds, it has enormous impact on how we live out our lives here on earth and how we approach every facet of our lives, including the ministry we do. If we believe people are born good, we have a completely different viewpoint of people and how to effectively interact with them. The answer to this question will shape all of our moral, social, and political views. By the way, I got most of this next part of the message from Prager University 
uh, from Dennis Prager who talked about uh, are people born good. Now, if we believe people are born good, when good people commit violent crimes, it is due to a myriad of things like poverty, racism, bigotry, a violent crime done to them, or some outside force, if we believe people are born good. This is why the only way to explain the bad behavior of, of, a, of a good person is that something drove them into this bad behavior. Let me tell you right off the bat, this is a false mindset and it will shape all aspects of how we deal with people. It affects how and if we discipline children. If we, if we believe children are born good, we spend little time training children to behave properly because they're already good. How we interact with coworkers, how or if we would hold people accountable, how we will view all people in general. If we believe people are born good, then we look for the fault and the reason for this crime outside of the individual himself. Isn't that right? Well, it's not my fault. If you ask uh, cr criminals in, in, or uh, people in prison, what do they, what are the most time do they say? I didn't do it. <laughs> I didn't do it. I was framed. It was this, it was that. It was, and, and I do the same thing. I do the same thing. No, I didn't. I didn't do that. Jeannie points out something. I, I didn't do that. That wasn't me. We, we all, that's human nature. Um, however, uh, in the next PowerPoint screen, however, if we don't believe people are born good, then as parents and society, we must undertake the major of effects to make children and citizens into good people. It's a huge, it's a completely different mindset. We must begin discipline of our children at an early age, lest they become spoiled. We all know that. As parents, we know that. <laughs> um, we must hold criminals accountable or responsible for the crimes they committed. We must have rules and regulations stipulating what can and can, cannot be done. We must have rules and regulations that in the homes, in the schools, in the businesses and workplaces, in the government. Look, for example, at babies. How many love babies besides me? I love babies. However, they are not, they are not good. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me explain before you start throwing rocks at me. They are entirely self-centered and they must be in order to survive. They are entirely self-centered. I want mommy, I want food, I want comfort. If I don't get it immediately, I'm gonna make your life miserable. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Yes, we have some, some witnesses here. Now, as much as we love babies, and as babies, we were all babies, we are all born narcissistic, which means we were born very selfish. It's me, it's all about me which is not being born good. Children can be cruel to other children, and it happens all the time in the form of bullying. It, happens, it happened to you, it happened to me. I've done it to other kids, they've done it to me. We've all done it, right? We have to teach our children over and over to respect others, to have manners saying please and thank you. How many times do we have to repeat it over and over and over? Sometimes we just want to give up. <laughs> Because we are born selfish and focused on ourselves. Now, saying and doing these things does not come natural, which is why we are not born good. Now, now don't get me wrong. So even though we're narcissistic, we have great potential to do good. We have great potential to do good. But looking at human history, we have seen many atrocities done to each other. And here's just a few of them. During World War I, the Ottoman Turks killed millions of Armenian Christians. During World War II, the German Nazis killed six million Jews plus millions of other people. 
the Soviet communists killed about 5 million Ukrainians plus 25 million other innocent people. The communist Chinese killed about 70 million Chinese and enslaved many of the rest. North Korea has enslaved all the people of its country except for a few elites. After the colonization of, of Congo in Africa, when it ended in 1998, in a 10-year span, over 5 million people were murdered. Before that, 10 million Africans were enslaved in the European slave trade, excuse me, which spilled over into America. Then another 10 to 18 million Africans were enslaved by Arab slave traders. And the list goes on and on and on. These are just a few of the atrocities that we as humans have. Our record is not good. In our universities and newspapers and television shows, there's a different mindset. It, it, it is a given that external forces are the cause of crime. You've heard it on the news. Uh, that's why there's so much advocacy for gun control. Guns kill people. People don't kill people. It's the guns' fault. Take away the guns. But it's not the guns. It's the people. The people will find another way to kill them if it's not a, with a gun. So, in our universities, newspapers, and television shows, it is given that external forces cause crime. This is not true. It is society that is the problem instead of the individual. If it were not for racism, America's inner cities would be far wealthier. People are saying, because of racism, our inner cities are poor. I can tell you, brothers and sisters, that is not the reason. That is not the reason that inner cities, inner cities uh, are not wealthier. So this kind of thinking goes on and on and on. At the core of this belief is that people are basically good, which again is wrong. It is society that makes them bad. Again, this is simply not true. So with all of that aside, what does God's word say about people? So let's look at what God's word says about people as to whether they are basically good. And we look to Jeremiah 17, 9. Here's what God said. The heart of mankind is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, test the heart and God knows it. In, this, in, the, in the next PowerPoint screen, in Romans 3, 10, which is uh, actually a, uh, a re-quote of Psalm 14, 1 through 3, and Psalm 53, 1 through 3, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They all have turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. The next scripture verse says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed as uh, to be demonstrated or to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, uh, Mark seven twenty says this, and and he said, with I believe Jesus speaking, what comes out of a man is what defiles him, defiles man, for. For from within, out of the heart of men, produce evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Now, this is what God's word said. It's not my word. Amen? 
In Mark 10, 18, in the next PowerPoint screen, Jesus said, so Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good. How many people are good? No one. But one, that is God. Now let me interject something here. Again, we have the potential to do great good. But just like if you have a nice, fresh cup of water and uh, you went and somebody went and got a dropper full of toilet water and put it in that water, would you drink it? <laughs> no, because it's all contaminated. One sin contaminates all of us, our entire being. So in Ephesians 2, 1, the next PowerPoint screen, Ephesians, uh, or it says, and we've gone over this, and, and you he made alive. So is there any hope for us? Is there any good for us? We're getting to the good part finally. We had to get all that junk out of the way. Now we're getting to the good part. And you he made alive who are dead in trespasses and sin. Can we possibly be good? Absolutely. Can we possibly do uh, righteous holy things? Absolutely. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves, the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So there is a way to be good. And then the next PowerPoint screen, right after this verse is, but God, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. You know, God has a great love for you. Even when we were dead in trespass, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. <coughs> Excuse me in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. As we look further, the next screen, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourself. Even the faith that we have is not from ourselves. It is, it is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. I can't boast that I do better than you, and you can't boast that you do better than me, because it's by grace, God's grace. For we, for we, read this with me, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. When did God prepare him? The good works? long ago beforehand so the answer is a resounding yes God, we have the potential to do great good and the next powerpoint screen summarizes how we can do or become good the only good works we can do or how we become good is by walking in the holy spirit and letting god do the works the good works he has created for us to do before we were even born. Amen? Amen? What an awesome God. He wants us to be good. He wants us to do good works. This is the only goodness mankind has, is to let God do His good works through us. Is there a hallelujah? Amen. Is that a blessing? God loves you so much, He wants you to let Him do His good works through you. So, the next PowerPoint screen says, in conclusion, dear fathers, your greatest job and your greatest accomplishment is to lead your family into a deeper, more intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ every day. Amen? What a blessing God has given us. He has given us His goodness. He has taken out all of our old stuff, and when we allow Him to, He will fill us with His goodness. Amen. What a great God we serve. May we bow before him.